All right. Well, without further ado, uh, Nando, it's time for your awesome commentary segment. All righty. Here we go. Okay. Hey, does anyone remember at the beginning of the pandemic when no one could get toilet paper? Video has emerged of an alarming scene in a Sydney supermarket of two women coming to blows in an argument over the right to buy multiple packets of toilet tissue. Ah, uh, yes. The great toilet paper shortage of 2020 was just the funniest example of a very troubling thing, namely the vulnerability of our global supply chains. Yes, the coronavirus pandemic has laid bare that the supply chains that we rely on to live are very susceptible to shocks. I mean, the United States, the richest country on earth, could not even manufacture the bare minimum in terms of PPE and masks and the like. And all of this has dealt a major blow to neoliberal globalization fundamentalists. You know who I'm talking about. It's the Thomas Friedmans of the world, the John Stossels of the world. They've been arguing for 30 years that globalization, meaning the unfettered movement of capital and so-called free trade, has been the best thing that has ever happened to the world. Next time you see the protesters screaming about the evils of free trade and globalization, remember this. A survey found that more than 80% of economists think America should eliminate all trade barriers. All of them. And that would be good. Get rid of these things. <laughs> all of it. Leave free people alone to make whatever trades they want. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an updated argument uh, of the version, the one uh, David Ricardo made in the 19th century. You've probably heard it in your high school economics class. He famously used the example of Portuguese winemakers and British cloth ma manufacturers. He said that the Portuguese were really good at making wine while bad at making cloth. Meanwhile, the English were amazing at making cloth, but really shitty at making wine. No argument there. Therefore, the British should not be making cloth and wine and just stick to cloth, while the Portuguese should not stop making cloth and stick to wine. Then the countries trade and everybody wins. And it's hard to overstate just how deeply this theory is ingrained within our ruling class. It is accepted as absolute fact by everyone from Mitt Romney to Barack Obama and everyone in between. They say that all of this free trade has led to an historic reduction in extreme poverty around the world. Notice the use of the word extreme. And they, taught, they trot out intellectuals like friend of Jeffrey Epstein, Steven Pinker, to legitimize the argument for them. Steven Pinker has made millions of dollars writing books and giving lectures saying things like this. Well, any aspect of human well-being that you measure has shown an increase. We live longer, more of us go to school, uh, life is safer, fewer of us die in wars. And the point of the book is not just to document the, pro the, the progress, that's the middle section of the book, and I try to do it in 75 graphs, knowing that people will be incredulous. There's they a just lot of data in the book. They just won't believe it unless they s see the graph showing poverty declining, showing deaths in war going down. Yeah, those pesky people, they just won't believe the data. I have 75 graphs. I mean, look, poverty's declining. I mean, elites just love this shit. They eat it up for the simple reason that it makes them feel good about themselves as the winners of a system that has made them richer than ever. It's a way to launder their own sense of guilt. But the reality is very different. Because a new report from Philip Alston, the outgoing United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, meaning the guy whose job it literally was to study this stuff, blows all of that propaganda out of the water. The good rapporteur said the following. Over the past decade, the UN world leaders and pundits have promoted a self-congratulatory message of impending victory over poverty. But almost all of these accounts rely on the World Bank's international poverty line, which is utterly unfit for the, use of per uh, for the purpose of tracking such progress. The World Bank's official poverty line, by the way, is $1.90 a day. Alston continues, the bank line shows the number of people in extreme poverty fell from 1.9 billion in 1990 to 736 million in 2015. But the line is scandalously unambitious, and the best evidence shows it doesn't even cover the cost of food or housing in many countries. The poverty decline it purports to show is due largely to rising incomes in a single country, China. More on that in a sec. And it obscures poverty among women and often those excluded from official surveys, such as migrant workers and refugees. The result is a peric victory, an undue sense of immense satisfaction and dangerous complacency. Using more realistic measures, the extent of global poverty is vastly higher and the trends extremely discouraging. 
Even before the pandemic, 3.4 billion people, nearly half of the world, lived on less than $5.50 a day. That number has barely declined since 1990. And that World Bank statistic is the one most commonly used to show that, in fact, there is nothing to see here. And the system is working great. That anyone who criticizes the system is, in fact, a backward-looking, anti-science, anti-data troglodyte. People, in fact, should stop complaining because everything is awesome and things are only getting better. Well, that's just not true. And as Alston points out, the poverty gains that have occurred are limited almost exclusively to one country, China. And no matter what you think about China, it is true that they have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in the last few decades. What's interesting about that, however, is that they did it by ignoring the free trade evangelists. China has actually bucked the neoliberal consensus by instituting pretty strict capital controls and using things like tariffs to allow native industry to develop. Help. Sometimes they outright ban foreign companies from operating within their borders. I used to live in China, and I, you couldn't use Google and Facebook even back then. Allowing their own high-tech industry to catch up using things like WeChat. And now that the Chinese technology is in some ways surpassing American tech with things like TikTok and 5G, you're starting to see a split amongst the American ruling class on what to do about China. Some want to be more hawkish against them. Others, like Mike Bloomberg, want to continue having access to their vast markets. And it'll be interesting to see who wins that little battle. And ironically, the Chinese learned all of this from the United States because all of those protectionist policies are what allowed the United States' industry to develop in the 19th and early 20th centuries to become the most powerful in the world. Take a look at this graph that shows US tariffs versus the rest of the industrialized world. From about 1830 to 1930, the United States had the highest tariff rates in the world. That's because in 1830, the economies of England and France were way more developed, and the United States needed to protect its own industry from superior French and English goods. It's no surprise that once the United States became the dominant economy in the world, it changed its tune on all this and began to force countries to lower their tariffs because free trade benefits the already rich by preventing the developing world from actually developing. But since 2008, the most vocal criticisms of free trade have come from the xenophobic right. They say that the globalists have brought immigrants here to take our jobs. And on the left, we need to reject that right-wing framing, and we need to recover some of the progress that was made by the anti-globalization movement in the 1990s before it was all destroyed by 9-11. We don't want to advocate for countries to retreat from the international community in fierce competition with each other. We need to foster a spirit of cooperation and use international organizations to check against the power of multinational corporations. We need to in establish international standards for labor protections and the environment, and we need to end tax havens because there's an estimated $32 trillion tucked away in places like Bermuda and Luxembourg. I reckon we can solve a lot of our problems if we were able to get our hands on some of that money. Maybe we could even pay for Medicare for all. But we also need to realize that global supply chains are vulnerable to shocks. Some more rational countries like Finland actually stockpile things like medicine, food, and such in case that there is some sort of trade disruption. I bet they even had enough toilet paper to last through the quarantine. So yeah, that this was is something so good. That, that Lee Phillips talks about a lot, you know? So I'm excited to mm -hmm. ask him questions about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, he did a really great talk on Jacobin about coronavirus um, and how um, our system of capitalism, again, like really puts us in a terrible position to deal with uh, this pandemic. And I mean, we've been experiencing it firsthand. There's no question about it. But, you know, as you're talking about all of the historical context necessary to understand why our supply chains were disrupted the way they were and how we were really unable to recover effectively, it made me think of two different things uh, that we do critique a lot, but never in the context of a free trade. Just like the failure of uh, our education system, that's not to say I don't believe in public education, but mm. let's keep it real, the school boards who make decisions about what ends up in textbooks, uh, I think make a concerted effort to ensure that the historical context that you just mentioned right now about tariffs, for instance, don't actually make it in the textbooks. And then at the same time, the media. So, you know, when you mention that $32 trillion that uh, are stored in, you know, tax shelters, it just, it, I love that you brought up Medicare for all because that $32 trillion <laughs> figure makes me think of what the estimates were for 
paying for Medicare for all uh, within the time span of one decade. Yeah. And each reporter, every time they'd interview Bernie Sanders, it was like, how are we going to pay for that? How are we going to pay for that? Literally, if you do nothing else and all you do is find a way to get that money back to the United States where it belongs, you can pay for a decade's worth yeah. of single payer health care, meaning every single American has the health care they need, the treatment they need for anything, including, you know, optical, dental. It just, you know, we need to think about how as a country, mostly due to propaganda and ignorance, we've decided that we'd rather allow the wealthy to keep their tax shelters and uh, watch our fellow Americans die from illnesses they don't need to die from. Well, it's funny when it comes to tax shelters, all of a sudden the ruling class becomes very respectful of a nation's sovereignty, <laughs> right? You know, like, I mean, they could, these are, these are tiny little countries, 15 minutes, like if the international community just put pressure on them to change these laws, it, it would happen in 15 minutes. It's, it's just, it's absurd that they, you know, like, well, what, we, can't, we can't do anything about it. We can't do anything about it. They're a sovereign nation. It's like, yeah, like we respect nation's sovereignty in any other context, right? You know, like we just like invade people or bomb people. I mean, I'm not saying we should bomb Bermuda. But, you know, if you if they applied any sort of international pressure on them, they would absolutely end these tax havens in 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's just it's it's become all this all this stuff has become kind of very um, ingrained and, and almost like accepted like as, as like a scientific fact. And it's just <laughs> it's just not true. Like, it's just I mean, it's it's as anti science as you could be or you know what i mean like they, that's like the kind of argument they use against as a weapon against you know critics of of, of some of this stuff and again you know you uh, we have to sort of re be, retake the narrative from the right because like they're 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 doing the thing that the right always does well which is identify a problem but then offer the incorrect solutions that distract from the actual villains of the whole thing you know you yeah and that's and liberals just what they do is like they reject that the problem exists. And then, so then people are like, but wait, no, the problem does exist. And that's why like liberals keep on losing credibility over and over and over again on this kind of thing. Um, they just browbeat people and say like, you know, you're dumb, you're dumb because like, you don't believe in this stuff. And it's like, well, no, you're dumb because you don't believe in this stuff, you know? So. Right, and, and look, so there are people who are just ignorant of the facts. That, and you know, on one hand, it's not like our media does a good job in, in really informing people on what's going on and why things are the way they are. Um, so like the average citizen, I, I don't want to be too harsh on them. I want, but I do want to be harsh on, um, you know, just like the political establishment mm -hmm. that wittingly, knowingly perpetuates the lies about the wrong solutions, right? So, you know, when you mentioned the data about how uh, globalization has uh, lifted so many people out of poverty, I mean, I hear that extreme talking poverty. all the time. Extreme it's always poverty, the right. It's always the caveat. <laughs> Right. <laughs> That's true. And it, it reminded me of uh, the Zizek uh, debate with Jordan Peterson because it was the talking point that Jordan Peterson kept using. But what we need to understand is whenever you hear someone cite data or make a point like that, the data can always be twisted to fit any narrative. And that's exactly what's been going on when it comes to this uh, notion of free trade. And, you know, when we think of free trade, we also have to think about the fact that it's not just about trading commodities or trading agricultural products. In the case of, you know, trade with China, it was mostly about uh, trading U.S. goods or, you know, uh, yeah, U.S. goods or U.S. commodities for incredibly cheap labor. Mm -hmm. And so not only did that um, put our supply chain in jeopardy, and we're feeling the consequences of that right now with the pandemic, um, but more importantly, I mean, we've seen how it has eroded uh, the economic stability for so many Americans throughout, you know, a few decades now. Mm -hmm. um, so there are real consequences to that. And uh, it, it's actually led a lot of people to poverty. Yeah. And uh, I love that you brought up uh, the China angle because there's just a lot of, I think, simplistic thinking about why Donald Trump banned Chinese apps. People mm -hmm. think that it's only because Trump was salty about the fact that TikTok users trolled his Tulsa rally. <laughs> but I mean, we've been during the Obama administration, there was that pivot to China, right? Oh, yeah. Focusing on China. And it, it has to do with our Silicon Valley fueled economy. If you look at you mentioned this to me, Nando, if you look at the stock market, 
I mean, the only um, industry that's doing really well in the stock market during the pandemic is Silicon Valley. And yeah. uh, the Trump administration wants to protect that. I will never forget Barack Obama going on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon to slow jam the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was the free trade agreement that was written in secret by uh, corporate attorney corporate attorneys and like was supposed to be rammed through Congress without anyone actually reading it or seeing what was inside of it. He went on Jimmy Fallon to slow jam. You know how he has that segment, slow jam the news. Obama went on to slow jam the TPP. It's one of the most embarrassing liberal things I've ever seen. I encourage you to go on YouTube and look for it. It's probably still there. It, I'll never forget it. It's just ingrained in my memory forever. It's amazing. I actually haven't seen it, so I got to check that out. Yeah.